So last time I was talking about the five books of Moses, and I mentioned that the names of the books um, in Hebrew are usually just either the first word or the second word or the first significant word of the book. Um, as opposed to, let's say, in the Septuagint, where you actually have official names, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. Um, and uh, interestingly enough, in the 13th century, Nachmanides, uh, Nachman, um, Moses ben Nachman, also in Hebrew gives those same connotations to the five books of Moses by calling the first one Sefer Habria, which is like the book of creation. And the second one he calls Sefer Geula, the Exodus he calls the um, the book of uh, of redemption. Leviticus he calls the book of the Kohanim of the priests. Numbers he calls the um, the book of the Pukudim, which means to count the people. And Deuteronomy he calls Mishneh Torah, which means exactly that Deuteronomy, going over the Torah a second time. So it seems that it was used in Jewish circles too, uh, at least in 13th century uh, Spain. But uh, I said that there's even significance to the Hebrew words which seem to be at random by calling it Breshit and Shmot, etc. And I gave an example last time of Shmot, how the use of names is very significant at the, book, at the beginning of the book of Exodus. Okay, so today I'd like to continue and talk about three parts of the Tanakh. Hebrew Tanakh is Torah, the five books of Moses, Nevi'im, the books of the prophets, and Ketuvim, the hagiographa, the later um, books. And I'm going to follow here the Masoretic text enumeration of the books in the, um, the, um, the Christian enumeration is slightly different in some of the books, and but this is what's called the Masoretic text, which is really what's called the Hebrew Bible. Masora in Hebrew means traditia. It means our tradition, the Masoretic text. So you have five books of Moses. And then you have eight books of the prophets. In Hebrew, the word prophet is navi. Navi. Navi is a prophet. Uh, the word navi is an unusual word. We have here. Avi nun beit yud aleph. Um, even when I ask um, Israelis, what do you think navi means? So, meaning what is the root? So people think lahavi to bring something, but it's not because the nun is in the is in the root itself, whereas lahavi comes from the word bo, so the root would be beit bav aleph. So navi, it seems that the root is actually nun yud. Bait. You have in Isaiah, Borei Niv Sfataim, God creates the words of the mouth. In Hebrew, the word Niv means to speak. In modern Hebrew, Niv is a dialect. In biblical Hebrew, it just means to speak. So the Navi is the one who speaks on behalf of God. And the word Niv Sfataim, he speaks on behalf of God. That seems to be the root of the word Prophet, somebody who speaks in the name of God. Now, we have a sort of hierarchy in the Masoretic text or in the, in, our, in, the, in the Hebrew tradition. You have the five books of Moses, which are considered the highest level of prophecy. It's called the prophecy of Moses. All of the five books of the Torah are the prophecy of Moses. There's a discussion about the eight last Sentences, the last eight last verses of the book of Deuteronomy. Do you know why there's a problem with the last eight verses of the book of Deuteronomy? Can anybody guess? If you check the eight last verses. I forget where it finishes. No, not 32. It's like, it goes until, no more than that. 
Here it is. Okay, I think you can see it. I hope you'll be able to see it. Does somebody have it in front of them? No, in uh, Romanian? It's verse 5 in chapter 34. Can you see it in front of you? Would anybody like to read in Romanian the, the verses from verse 5 in chapter 34? Moise slujitorul Domnului a murit acolo în Sara Moab după cuvântul Domnului. Right, he buried him in Moab. Mm -hmm. uh, continue. A little bit. La un grop, uh, sorry, I put some uh, something in my eyes and that was, I don't see very well. Um, La un gropat în vale, în țara Moab, față în față. Betpoar. În fața Betpoarului. Yes. Cu Betpoar. Nimeni nu știe mormântul până în ziua de azi. Right. So, the question is, who wrote these verses where it says Moses, the servant of God, died and he was buried in Moab in the valley opposite Betpoar and nobody knows where his grave is. And he was 120 years old when he died. His eyes were not weak. His strength was not gone. And the children of Israel grieved for Moses in the plains of Moab for 30 days. And Joshua, the son of Nun, was filled with spirit of wisdom as Moses had laid his hands on him. The Israelites listened to Joshua and did what God commanded Moses. Since then, no prophet has ridden in, risen in Israel like Moses. Who God knew face to face, who did all the signs and the wonders that the Lord sent him to do in Egypt, to Pharaoh and to all his officials and to the whole land. For no one has ever shown the mighty power or performed the awesome deeds that Moses did in the sight of all Israel. So the question is, who wrote these eight last verses? So we'll see in a moment, not in a moment, maybe maybe today or next time. The, the Talmud argues about these last eight verses. Uh, one opinion, the opinion of Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai, is that the last eight verses were actually written by Moses, where God says to Moses, write in the Torah that Moses dies, because that's what's going to happen, and Joshua is going to take over. That's one opinion. The other opinion is that actually Joshua wrote it. Meaning after Moses died, Joshua wrote the last eight verses of the book of Deuteronomy. This would seem, of course, more logical. Um, and um, that means then the five books of Moses is the prophecy of Moses, but the last eight verses were actually Joshua, according to that opinion. So let's get back to this. So all the five books in general, and the, except for the last eight verses of Deuteronomy, which is a question, are the prophecy of Moshe. And this is considered the highest level of prophecy. Jewish law, in Hebrew halacha, is only derived from the five books of the Torah, of the Pentateuch. We do not consider the books of the prophets uh, something which can teach us Jewish law. Even though there are items of Jewish law mentioned in the prophets, it's still not used as a basis to prove anything. Even if we have something in the prophets which makes us question something in the five books of Moses, we just don't pay attention. Most of the time, it's just things adding on, so it's not a major problem. But I'm just saying Jewish law is only learned from the five books of Moses. So what are the eight books of the prophets? First one is Joshua. 
and they really go more or less in chronological order. So Joshua is right after Moses. You have the book of Judges. Judges who came after Joshua, you had, for instance, Kalev ben Yifune was one of the first judges, and it goes on. And then you have the book of Samuel 1 and 2. Samuel, of course, anoints King Saul and King David. Then you have Kings 1 and 2. These four books of the, of the um, Bible, Joshua, Judges, Samuel 1 and 2, and Kings 1 and 2, we refer to them in Hebrew as the early prophets. Nevi'im Rishonim, the early prophets. They obviously can't be the first prophets. In modern Hebrew, Rishon means first. But that's impossible because there are many prophets before them. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Sarah, um, Re uh, Rebecca. I mean, you had lots. <laughs> so <laughs> even um, Moses himself. So how could these be the first prophets? They're the early prophets. In Hebrew, the word Rishon and the word Acharon, whereas in modern Hebrew, Rishon means first and Acharon means last. So if you have a race of people running 50 meters, the one who wins the race is the Rishon. He came in first. The one who comes in last is called Acharon. But not so in Biblical Hebrew. In Biblical Hebrew, Rishon means early and Acharon means, la means later. Sometimes Rishon can mean at the beginning like Bereshit. But even there, it's not Rishon, it's Reshit. It's a slightly different formulation of, um, of the word. And, and Acharon in, in the Bible always means what comes later. I'll give you an example. In the book of Genesis, um, I should probably get it, but uh, I could tell you where it is for those who want to follow. Uh, one moment. Look it up for you. Okay, it is in Genesis chapter 33, verse 2. Right before Jacob is about to meet his brother Esau, Esau. So, Jacob prepares because he's afraid that Esau is coming to fight him. And he splits the camp into three parts. And he says, if Esau comes after one part, then the other, excuse me, into two parts. If Esau comes to one part of the camp, the other ones at least can run away. So this way, Esau won't be able to destroy the whole camp. And it also says he, he prepared in lines. So he put, it says, the verses say that he put the, the midwives and their children at the beginning. Then he put Leah and her children, Acharonim, it says in Hebrew, Acharonim, which I'm tr translating as after and not the end. And then it says, then Rachel and Joseph, Acharonim. So if Acharonim made the end, it couldn't be Leah, couldn't be the end, and Rachel the end if they're one after another. So obviously in Hebrew, Acharon means what comes later. Or in modern Hebrew, we would say Acharkach. So Acharon in the Bible means Acharkach, what comes later. So Nevi'im Acharonim are the later prophets. Nevi'im Rishonim are the early prophets. There are other proofs for this too, but I, I'm not going to go into it. Also from the book of Exodus, you can also prove that Acharon means comes later. This will explain an interesting verse in the Bible. It says in Isaiah, chapter 44, verse 6. This is what God, the King of Israel, and their Redeemer the God of the Lord of the host says, Ani Rishon, Vani Acharon, which is normally translated, I am first and I am last. 
and besides me there is no God. Isaiah 44, verse 6. So if you understand it that way, okay, God is first and God is last. But what about what comes in the middle? <laughs> but according to the way I just explained it, where Rishon is what comes before and Acharon is what comes after, the verse is saying, I am what comes before and I'm everything that comes after. And aside from me, there is no other God. It's much more powerful. If you're following what I'm saying. Ani Rishon, I'm what comes first. And I'm everything after that too. Umi baladai and Elohim, and therefore besides me there is no God. Isaiah 44, verse 6. Okay, so let's go back now to the other. Uh, question, anybody have some questions now? Okay, let's keep going then. Um, where is it? Here, it is. So, um, that's called Nevi'im Rishonim, the early prophets. Joshua, Judges, Samuel, 1 and 2, Kings 1 and 2. Then we have another four books, which look like much more than four books, and I'll explain what I mean. You have the book of Isaiah. These are called the later prophets. Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel. And then all the 12 minor prophets are considered one book. The 12 minor prophets, minor does not mean they were under 18 years of age. It just means that the books are small. Hosea, Joel, Amos, Obadiah, Yonah, Micha, Nachum, Chavakuk, Zephania, Haggai, Zechariah, and Malachi. Um, the last three of them, Haggai, Zechariah, and Malachi, actually saw the construction of the second temple. So they lived... Uh, right through the Babylonian exile, meaning at the end of the Babylonian exile, and came back to Jerusalem to see the establishment of the second temple in Jerusalem, Haggai, Zechariah, and Malachi. In the book of Haggai, he tests the priests, the Kohanim, to see if they still remember the laws of the temple. In the book of Malachi, at the end of the book of Malachi, he says, remember the Torah of Moses, my servant, which you were taught at Choreb. I, am, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the great and awesome day of God, and he shall return the sons to the fathers and the fathers to the sons, etc. So this idea that according to Jewish tradition, Malachi is the last prophet, and therefore he says, remember the Torah of Moses, and, um, and I will send eventually Elijah the prophet, who is going to be the one who will give the news of the redemption. So that's the end of the books of the prophet, Malachi. So, and the last part, so, and these are called eight, this is the enumeration of the Talmud. One, two, three. All these 12 short books are considered one volume. So that's why they call it the eight books of the prophets. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and all 12 of these are another book. Books of the Prophets. That's the Talmud in Baba Batra, um, page 12. Then the third part, um, called Kituvim in Hebrew, which means writings, later writings. And in Greek, we call it Hegiographa, which is also later writings. Grapha means writings. And these are the, the books that came in later. So, what's in the Hegiographa? According to the Talmud, these are 11 books. The first ones are the Psalms of David. I told you the story one time, probably I was in this taxi in Toronto, and the taxi driver was Somali, Muslim. So I mentioned that I was from Israel, and he says, oh, and, and uh, so he says, so you're Jewish? I said, yeah. He says, tell me something. What do you believe in? I said, well, I believe in the Bible. He says to me, no, you don't. You believe in the Torah. I said, okay, you got me there. <laughs> so then he says, okay, I'm going to tell you what's holy to us, and you tell me what's holy to you. So I said, okay, what's holy to you? He says, for us, there are four holy books. There's to the Islam. There's the Quran. There's the Torah, which they also considered holy. 
There's the Injil, which is, by the way, the New Testament in Arabic. And there's also the Book of David, which is the Psalm. They consider four books holy, the Quran, the Torah, the Injil, which is the New Testament, and the, um, and the Psalms of David which is interesting, meaning they don't realize the Psalms of David is part of a larger collection um, of that. So, uh, yeah, I just recall that, that story. Okay, getting back to this. So the Psalms of David are the first of the hagiograph. Proverbs, which is associated with King Solomon. Eov, Job. Song of Songs, which is also associated with King Solomon, because it says, Shira Shiri Masher Lishlomo, the Songs of Songs of Solomon. Proverbs also, it's called Mishle Shlomo, the Prophets of Solomon. Proverbs of Solomon. Ruth, which is associated by the Talmud with um, Samuel the prophet. It shows the, um, the um, genealogy of King David. And uh, Samuel anoints King David as the first um, king of Israel from the tribe of Judah. Esther, which is probably one of the later books of the Bible. Uh, remember, Esther is telling a story which happens at the end of the Babylonian exile after the Persians have taken over. Remember, the Nebuchadnezzar was the king of Babylonia who destroyed the first temple in the year 586 before the Common Era. 586. I think I may be wrote yet, right here. Destruction of the first temple, the Babylonians, and that was Nebuchadnezzar. The king of uh, Babylonia. And the Jews are in exile in Babylonia for in 470 years. And, and then you have Cyrus Koresh, Cyrus, the first king of Persia, who's mentioned in the Bible in two places. One place is the book of Ezra. Another place is in the, um, the second book of Chronicles. is mentioned here. Uh, here, Chronicles, two, right at the end, where he allows the Jews to go back to Jerusalem and build up the temple. Now, Cyrus is the first Persian king. And the book of Esther takes place under the Persian Empire, under a king whose name is Xerxes, Ahasuerus. Some people think maybe Atar Xerxes. It's a question. But he's definitely after Cyrus. Whether he's Xerxes or Atar Xerxes or Xerxes the second, he's probably a Xerxes because we have another Hebrew name, which is called Atar Shasta. Atar Shasta which sounds like Atar Xerxes. So he's probably Xerxes. Uh, and it's taking place already in the Persian exile after some of the Jews have gone back to the land of Israel. After Cyrus the I uh, allowed them to go. So Esther is probably the latest book to make its way into the Hebrew Bible. Um, even though Haggai... Uh, and Malachi are really around at the same time, more or less. But most probably it's the last book to make its way, because it was also not it, written in the land of Israel. It's written under the Persian Empire. It's probably the last book to go in. I'll mention more about that a little bit later, because um, there are other reasons to think of. So, Esther, Ecclesiastes. Esther is the story of Purim. Ecclesiastes is also associated with King Solomon. Um, it says, Ani Kohelet, I Kohelet, I Ecclesiastes, I was a king in Jerusalem, also associated with Solomon. Lamentations, which is associated with Jeremiah the prophet, talking about the destruction of the first temple, which Jeremiah lived through. The book of Daniel, which takes place during the Babylonian exile. Now, Ezra and Nehemiah, which normally we think of two books, and the Talmud can considers them one, because chronologically they continue one another. Both of them leaders of the Jewish community in the land of Israel after Cyrus gives the green light to go there. And then Chronicles 1 and 2, which is sort of like a historical rendition of the whole Bible from the beginning to the end, 
all over again. Chronicles 1 and 2. So again, you have your seven books. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, and 11. Altogether, the 24 books of the Hebrew Bible. Okay? Um, I want to point out that not only do we read every week another pericopa of the five books of Moses, of the Pentateuch, but on the holidays, there are, it's, there are five scrolls here which are read on the holidays. These Song of Songs, Ruth, Esther, Ecclesiastes, and Lamentations. Song of Songs is, is read in the synagogue on the Shabbat of Passover, on the Sabbath of Passover. It's about a love story, which in, in Jewish tradition, the love story is a metaphor for the love between God and Israel. And like in every love story, there has its ups and downs. There's no uh, perfect couple. And uh, it's a very interesting story. I always said the Song of Songs is not, ex is not the regular romantic love story. Because in the Song of Songs, the guy and the girl, they never get together. <laughs> so if it's just a romantic story, it's quite a failure. Because... Not only does it, it doesn't have a happy ending, it doesn't even have a sad ending. It's like they just, when she finally meets her beloved, she says to him, now go, um, go my beloved on the mountains of Bater. Um, why is she telling him to go? <laughs> What's the rush? <laughs> so the Song of Songs um, according to our understanding of it, is always is talking about the love story between God and, and Israel and the exile. And that's why it doesn't end, because the exile didn't end yet. Anyhow, so that's the Song of Songs. The Book of Ruth, which I mentioned, has the, so Ruth is read on the, on the Hebrew Pentecost, which is Shavuot. Um, also, it has the genealogy of King David. The Book of Esther, on the Jewish festival of Purim, which is before Passover, at the end of the winter. Ecclesiastes is read on the Sabbath of the festival we just had now, Tabernacles, Sukkot. And Lamentations is not read on a festival, it's read on a fast day of the ninth of Av, where we commemorate the destruction of two temples, the first and the second temple, um, on the ninth day of Av, which was not a great day for the people of Israel. Then you have the book of Daniel. Daniel, I mentioned, is during the Babylonian exile. Ezra and Nehemiah, the ones who were leaders of the Jewish community in the land of Israel, in Judea at that time, um, when, they, uh, when Cyrus allowed them to make the move, and Chronicles 1 and 2. So these are the 24 books of the Bible. Say, so, hey, look, just tell them. One of the problems with the Zoom, everybody becomes passive. <laughs> so I noticed that in all my classes on Zoom, when you're in the class, it's like, oh, you can say things, but, um, but here people are more passive. We listen. Oh, okay. That's very good. That's actually not easy to do. Most people, when they talk, they don't listen. <laughs> so have the ability to, to listen is really a talent. Let it, yeah. Once you can listen, people who are very silent, these are the ones that become very smart. The, in the Mishnah, the Ethics of the Fathers, it says, Siag Shtika, which means the best way to become wise is by being silent. And another place, the Midrash says, "Mila um, besela shtikuta betre," which means a word is worth one coin, and silence is worth two coins. <laughs> Good one. Two silver coins. Yeah. Mila besela shtikuta betre. Okay. Um, I'm just wondering what to talk about here. There's lots to say, so let me just. Let's take it like this, see if I can find the continuation here. 
Okay, let's start with this. Who wrote the scriptures? This is not going to be what we call a scholarly discussion. This is the traditional discussion from the Talmud. The Talmud, I will discuss it a little bit later, but it's a book which is finished around the year 500 of the Common Era in Babylonia, and it's a collection of um, oral traditions of Judaism. So the Talmud asks us the question of who wrote the 24 books of the Bible. So Talmud says, Moses, this is in Baba Batra. Baba Batra literally means the final gate. There are three books that are called the first gate, the middle gate, and the final gate. It's actually not the end of the Talmud. It's just called the three gates of the laws of damages. So it's a book called the final gate, Baba Batra. Moses wrote his own book <laughs> and the portion of Balaam and the book of Job. First of all, it's interesting that the Talmud claims that Moses wrote the book of Job, which means that Job is a metaphor. By the way, the Talmud seems to be of that opinion, that the book of Job is a metaphor to explain the problems of why sometimes the righteous suffer and why do the wicked prosper. The Talmud in Brachot, in another tract, that actually says that Moses was very concerned with this question. And he said to God, um, why did the wicked prosper? And God answered him by saying, um, you cannot behold my countenance. You can only see from the back. Which means there's some things that I cannot explain to you. Because no man can behold me and live. And the way I explain that is that when you're in the game, which means of life in this world, there's certain things that you cannot know the the answer to because if you do, it's um, you can't be in the game anymore. It's like you know if you go into a casino and you broke the code of how the roulette machine works or blackjack, which means you're going to win every time. They kick you out. <laughs> you can't play the game anymore because it's a game of chance. It's not a game of winning all the time. In this world, there are certain questions. If you know the answer, you can't be here. You know, there's an interesting, um, and one of those questions, like why the righteous suffer and why the wicked prosper, are much too central to the whole question of human life. You know, there's um, uh, Rabbi Jonathan Sack was the chief rabbi of Great Britain. And uh, they put some wonderful videos of, of him online. Uh, some of them, five minutes, ten minutes, are also his lectures, just a lot of wonderful things. And one of them, especially during the pandemic, I spent lots of time uh, on things like this, which I'm sure other people did, looking on things on YouTube, etc. And one of them is this woman calls him on the phone, and they have it on the YouTube. And she says, I, I met you with my parents about a year ago. And my father asked you a question about why the why we can't know why the righteous suffer, or or, or see or like why is there evil in the world, <clears throat> which is really the same. And you said that you didn't have an answer for that question. It says, do you have anything further to say? So, Rabbi Sachs says, actually, I do. He says, okay, what do you have to say? He says, if we would actually know why there's evil in the world and why bad things happen to good people, and we actually knew the reason why it had to happen, we, we, wouldn't, uh, we wouldn't complain. We wouldn't oppose it. We wouldn't uh, protest. We would just let it go because... We now know the reason. But the human being is on this planet in order to protest evil. And that's why there's some things we're not supposed to know. When we see evil, we have to protest. And that's what God wants. I'll give you a very good example from the book of Genesis. In the book of Genesis, it's chapter... 14, if I remember correctly, 
It's called the battle of the four kings against the five kings during the time of Abraham. A very, very unusual chapter that people read and they say, what's the point of all this? And we read it in um, in, in another week, in Parsha Lech Lech, I think it is. So in that battle, um, there are four kings who come from the north, from the area of Turkey and, and uh, Iraq. And these four kings come to fight five kings who are situated in the area of the Dead Sea. And these five, and um, it's called the four kings against the five. I can show you the story. If it interests you. And, uh, maybe somebody can read in Romanian. It's Genesis, uh, let's see, I think it's chapter 14. Yes. We have in Hebrew and English. If you want, if somebody wants to read it, and uh, find this a fascinating story. And when when I give my interpretation, maybe you'll follow along when I when I think about it. But anybody want to read this in uh, Romanian? Chapter fourteen in Genesis. What verses? Um, start from the beginning. It's about low. And it came to pass in the days of Amraphel, the king of Shinar. Da. Iar în zile lui Amraphel, regele Shara, ale lui Arioc, regele Elisarului, și ale lui Kerde Laomer, regele Elamului, și ale lui Tidal, regele din Gutim. S-a By the way, the towns Shinar and Elam are both places today in Babylonia, which means in the area of Iraq, Turkey. They made war with Bera. Se facă război cu Bera, regele Sodomei, și Bârșa, regele Gomorei, cu Șinavă, regele Azmei, cu Șemeber, regele Teboinalui, și cu regele din Bela sau Tsoar. Yes. Toți aceștia din urmă s-au adunat în Valea Sidim, unde e acum Marea Cea Sărată. Right, the area of the Dead Sea, yes. 12 ani stătuse răiei în robia lui Keter la Omar, iar în anul al 13-lea s-au răzvrătit. Iar în al 14-lea an au venit Cheder la umăr și regii care țineau cu el și au bătut pe Rafaimi la Ashterot Karnaim. Ok, so what happened here? Ilahan, the four kings were very powerful kings. Emimi la Shavei Cristiaim. Yes, so the four kings, it seems, made the five kings pay heavy taxes to them. That's the, I mean, what it says here, 12 years they served Kedar Omer, which means they paid tax to Kedar Omer, who is the strongest of the four kings. And in the 13th year, they decided enough is enough. We don't pay the tax anymore. We are going to rebel. And they rebelled. And now the four kings were coming from the north to teach them a lesson. <laughs> what happens when you don't pay your tax to us? Okay, that's what's going on. In the 14th year, Kedar Omer and the other kings and they smote not only the four kings, but anybody who was in their way. The Rafaim in Ashtorot Kanaim, the Zuzim in Ham, the Emim in the Shavek Yeratayim. On the way, we were just battling people on the way, all the way down to prove a point. Okay, verse 8. Atunci au ieșit regele Sodomei, regele Gomorei, regele Atmei, Regele Țeboimului și Regele Belei sau Țoarului și s-au bătut în Valea Sidim. So there was a big battle between the four kings against the five kings around the, it's called the area of Sidim, which means um, tar, white tar. And uh, this is somewhere around um, the Dead Sea area. And they fought Kedar Omer, the king of Elam, and Tidal, king of Goyim, Fel, the king of Shinar, these four kings from the north. And the kings of Stoma and Gomorrah, they, they fell there. The five kings lost against the four kings. And the four kings took all of the spoils, all of the goods of Stoma and Amora, and they went. But they made one mistake. They also took Lot as Abraham's nephew. Okay, you want to read from uh, verse 12? Verse what? 12. And 12, right? 
12, Valea Sidimului era... A, tu ai luat, sorry. Când s-au dus, s-au luat de asemenea pe lot nepotul lui Avram, care trăia în Sodoma și toată averea lui. Dar venind unii din cei scăpați, au găsit pe Avram evreul, care trăia pe atunci în stejarul lui Mamvrei, Mamvrei, Amoreul, fratele lui Eșcol și fratele lui Aner, care erau uniți cu Avram. So Abraham heard that his nephew was taken by the four kings. He also called upon three of his confederates, of his friends, to help him. And he took 318 men to fight. <laughs> right? That's verse 14. Abraham heard that his brother was taken captive, meaning his nephew. And he took trained men and in his house, 318. That's all. And they fought the four kings and they won. He pursued the four kings all the way to Damascus. He brought back the goods and Lot and the women and everybody. He brought everybody back in the king of stone. In other words, he saved the five kings by fighting off the four kings. And, um, and the king of Sodom went in to thank him. Then Melchizedek, the king of Shalem, Shalem is later on becomes Jerusalem, had bread and wine and was the priest of God. He blessed him, etc. Then the king of Storm says, give me the, person, the people and you can take all the spoils. Abraham says to the king of Storm, lift up my hand, I will not take anything. Not even a thread or a shoelace. So nobody should say that you made Abraham rich. Only God can make me rich. Just the men, give them something to eat and their portion. Okay, understand what happened in this in this uh, pericopa, in this chapter, really? There's four kings. These four kings are having a battle with five kings. The four kings win the battle. But Abraham hears that Lot, his nephew, is taken by the four kings, who also lived in Storm, And Abraham goes, fights the four kings with another 380 guys, 318. They win the battle against the four kings. They chase the four kings all the way to Damascus. They let the five kings go. And that's the end of the story. This story, in my opinion, is one of the most important stories in the whole book of Genesis. I wonder if anybody could guess why. Okay, not everybody at the same time. I'll tell you why. But the story you understood, right? Is Abraham fighting off the four kings. It's actually quite a fantastic story. How could 318 men be able to... Obviously, God would have to help him on that one. But that's what's happening. He's able to fight off these four kings. The next pericopa after this is a story about five towns who are rebellious again, who are corrupt. You remember the names of the five towns? Sodom, Gomorrah, Adma, Svoim, so are the same five kings that Abraham saved. These same five kings are the ones in the next pericopa, <laughs> in the, literally almost the next chapter, where God is going to say to Abraham, I have to destroy these towns because they are corrupt. And the shouting has come up to the heaven, enough is enough. And it's and um, Abraham says to God, what do you mean? Is the judge of all earth not going to do justice? Maybe they're 50 righteous, maybe they're 40, maybe they're 30. It's the same people. It's the same five kings. So the question is like this. If these kings were already corrupt, Maybe those four kings who came from the north in order to get their um, their uh, their tax from the five kings, it was the hand of God that made the five kings rebel because he wanted the four kings to destroy them because they were corrupt. You understand what I'm saying? In other words, if you want to look at it this way through divine providence, 
divine providence was that the four kings should destroy the five kings because the five of the kings were corrupt. Who interfered? Abraham. Abraham interfered and he forced God's hand because he wanted to save his nephew Lot. And so God helped him for, fight off the four kings and save the five kings. But in next week's Perikopa, God will say to Abraham, unfortunately, I have to kill the five kings anyhow, because they're all corrupt, Sodom and Gomorrah. You understand what's going on here? Yes. In other words, what's going on here, God is willing to change his plan because of Abraham. And why is he willing to change his plan because of Abraham? Because Abraham is willing to put his life on the line to save Lot. And God is so impressed that there's a human being who's willing to risk his life for somebody else because that one person is innocent. Because we know Lot was innocent. He was actually saved from Sodom. But, and the fact that, and God is so, I would say, gets so enthusiastic when human beings are willing to do something for somebody else, he's willing to change the whole plan. Unfortunately, he's going to have to break the news to, to Abraham in a, in a few weeks that actually I have to kill the five kings anyhow somehow. <laughs> but thank you for what you did because finally a human being is standing up for another human being, which happens so rarely. Even Noah wasn't willing to do that. When God said there was a flood, Noah said, okay, what do you want me to do? Build a, build a, a ship, the ark. Okay, I'll build a ship. That's it. He doesn't try to defend the people. He doesn't say, God, why do, why do you want to destroy your, the creatures that you created? No, no questions, no nothing. Abraham questions, and God gets excited when human beings are willing to do things like that, to stand up for somebody else. And so many times a bad thing happens and nobody cares. It's not our problem. Abraham does the same when uh, God wants to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah, the same. He says, it's how you started the lesson, actually. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. And God could have said to Abraham, Abraham, it's your fault. <laughs> <laughs> because those four kings would have done the work. But he didn't say that. Because he was happy that Abraham, even though it interfered, he was happy. Because Abraham did the right thing. He tried to save Lot. But he explained to Abraham then unfortunately, there are no righteous people there. And the few righteous people, Lot and his sons and his daughters-in-law, his daughters and their sons-in-law, yeah, they can be saved, not a problem. But there's nobody else really who fits in the category of a righteous person. And if you remember the story, the sons didn't want to leave. Mm -hmm. yeah. I mean, the sons-in-law didn't want to leave. Lot had three daughters, and their husbands didn't want to go. They didn't believe that anything would happen. So it was only Lot and his, excuse me, and his two daughters. Lot and his two daughters. Okay, so I just want to tell you the story because you have this concept, um, and all this came from a discussion when we were talking about the book of Job, the issue of, of uh, evil in the world. But God wants, doesn't want us really to know why there's evil in the world because he wants us to protest. That's what Rabbi Sachs said, and we can see this in the story of Abraham. Where God doesn't say to Abraham, Abraham, this was my plan that the four, king, four kings battled the five kings, so don't interfere. He doesn't say don't interfere. He wants to see what Abraham will do. He trusts him that he'll try to do the right thing. So these stories, when you think of them in that, uh, in the secrets, sometimes they become very interesting. I will continue back to our first topic again. So who wrote the scriptures? <clears throat> Moses wrote his own book and the book of Job and the portion, the Perikopa of Bilam. Now, the story of Bilam takes place in the book of Numbers. Midbar. And it's in a Perikopa called Balak, which is the king of Moab. And there's a story that the king of Moab wanted to curse the Israelites when they were leaving um, Egypt. And so he, he pays this guy, Bilam, curse them, because Bilam was a well-known prophet and uh, magician. In the book of Joshua, he's called the magician. In the Bible, he's called, in 
in the book of Deuteronomy, he's called in, in Numbers, he's called a prophet, or referred to so. Um, or at least in I'm trying to think, is he called a prophet? No, he's actually not. The Talmud just calls him a prophet. And um and Balaam, if you know the story, tries to curse the Israelites, but he's not able to. And he says to Balak, I, I'm trying, but unfortunately, I can only say what God wants me to say. So, obviously, Moses wrote that if it's in the book of Numbers, because you just said that Moses wrote his own book. The way this is explained, uh, there are a few explanations. I'll give you two possibilities. When there's two possibilities, it means it's not clear. One of them is that if you read the book of uh, the um, book of Numbers, the whole story of Balaam takes place very far away from the Israelite camp in the mountains of Moab, which is today Jordan. So you might have thought that maybe Moses didn't write that because how would he know what happens between Balaam and, uh, and Balak? But therefore, the Thomas says, no, he did write it, despite the fact that it didn't take place nearby. He wrote the story. That's one interpretation, because he wrote it through prophecy. Another interpretation is that there might have been another book called the Book of Balaam, which maybe we do not have. That's another possibility. Okay, we continue. Joshua wrote the book which bears his name, the Book of Joshua, which is the first book of the prophets. And also the last eight verses of the Pentateuch of, of Deuteronomy, which I mentioned to you. It says Moses died. So this is the opinion that the last eight verses were written by Joshua. Samuel. It's actually a discussion. I told you it's a later on in the text here, it'll be a, a controversy. Samuel wrote the book that has his name. You have Samuel 1 and 2. And the book of Judges, which came before him, the Judges. And the book of Ruth show the genealogy of King David. David wrote the book of Psalms, including in this work the elders, namely Adam, Kitzedek, Abraham, Moses, Haman, Nutun, Saf, and the three sons of Korah. This is very interesting. The Talmud says that the Psalms of David include Psalms from ten other people. And uh, many of the Psalms actually mention these people. For instance, in Psalm 91, it says, a prayer of Moses, the man of God. Um, many of the Psalms are called Mizmor um, Asaf, which means a song of Asaf. But many of the Psalms also are called Bnei Korach. Lam Livnei Korach, to the maestro from the sons of Korach. Um, Abraham, Melchizedek, a lot of these are mentioned. Psalm num, and, uh, the, excuse me, Moses is 90. 91 is um, ascribed to Adam. It's called the song, Psalm, a song for the Sabbath day. 92 is also about the Sabbath day. But, um, um, so according to the Talmud, David didn't write all the Psalms. Some of them he collected. And if you know, in the Psalms at one point, it says, Kalu tfilot David ben Ishai. This is the end of the prayers of David, the son of Jesse, which makes it sound like there's other things there too. So it actually is interesting that the Talmud has this um, tradition that the Psalms of David are also a collection from other people who came before him. Jeremiah wrote the book which bears his name, the book of Jeremiah. The book of Kings, Jeremiah, who lived to see the destruction of the temple. And the book of Lamentations, which talks about the destruction of Jerusalem in the first temple period. Okay, so if we look back for a moment, we can sort of figure out what's going on here. Meaning, what was said here? Again, Moses writes his book, his five books of the Pentateuch, except for the last eight verses. Um, in the prophets, Joshua writes his book, Samuel writes the book of Judges, and Judges 1 and 2, which is an interesting question. How would he do two? Seems to be a little bit after him. I mean, well, 
Kings one and two, maybe it's not, I have to check again. Kings one and two. Then you have um, Jeremiah wrote his book. And that's where we are at the moment. Let's continue. Now the Talmud is going to say something unusual. I like the unusual stuff. King Hezekiah and his colleagues, his advisors, wrote the book of Isaiah, the book of Proverbs, Song of Songs, and Ecclesiastes. Now this is interesting. Why would Hezekiah write the book of Isaiah? Why didn't Isaiah write the book of Isaiah? The book of Proverbs says the Proverbs of Solomon. Why didn't Solomon write it? Song of Songs says the Song of Songs of Solomon. And Ecclesiastes says, I, Kohelet, was the king of Jerusalem. Okay, that could be less of a problem. But the other ones seem to be obvious that Isaiah writes Isaiah. And then Proverbs of Solomon. So here you have to understand. In Talmudic times, they didn't have a term for an editor. For the redactor, as we would say in French. When it says Hezekiah and his colleagues wrote Isaiah, they mean redacted Isaiah. They were the editors. You know, very often, you have a spiritual person, and they have ideas, and they write them down, but they really are not good at writing books. And they need a good editor. Many scholars are like that. I know lots of scholars that without a good editor, they can't put out a book. It doesn't mean they're not wise. It just means they don't have the editing capability. Isaiah was somebody like that. And Hezekiah, by the way, who is a contemporary of Isaiah, Isaiah is mentioned in the Book of Kings, and there's a meeting actually between Isaiah and Hezekiah in the Book of Kings. So Hezekiah did him a favor and edited the book. Why would he also have edited Proverbs, Song of Songs, and Ecclesiastes? Very simple. Hezekiah is a direct descendant of King Solomon. He lives about 650 years later, but he is a direct descendant. About 600 years later. Right? Well, No, less. What am I saying? 722 before. I'm sorry. He lives about 250 years later. So probably the manuscripts of Proverbs, songs, Song of Songs and Ecclesiastes, was kept in the royal palace. And Ezekiel, excuse me, and Hezekiah decided it's time to edit them and put them into book four. So that when the Talmud says wrote, here it means edited. He edited the book of Isaiah, book of Proverbs, Song of Songs, and Ecclesiastes. That's what it appears. By the way, that might even suggest Explain why Isaiah seems to be two books. Maybe there were two editors, one who did one part, one who did another part, because it says Hezekiah and his colleagues. It's possible. Okay. The men of the great assembly, the men of the great assembly wrote Ezekiel. Let's go back again to our list. Oh, he said Isaiah was edited by Hezekiah and his, and his group. They also edited Proverbs, Song of Songs, and Ecclesiastes. But then the men of the great assembly, um, it says, they were the ones who edited, again, I'm saying, um, where is it? Ezekiel. Why would this be, and also the, um, the 12 minor prophets, why would it be the men of the great assembly? First of all, I'll explain who they are. Who are the men of the great assembly? As far as we know, the men of the great assembly was sort of a court or possibly a political group which put together in the second temple period. Not at the beginning of the second temple period, because the Bible describes the beginning of the second temple period. You had... Zerubbabel, who was the head of the Jewish community, he was actually a descendant of, of King David from Judah. You had Ezra, Nehemiah, who ran the community too. So we know what happened in the first, say, 50 years. 
But after that, it seems that there were, the leadership was split. Um, not split, but it was led by 120 scholars who was called the Men of the Great Assembly. Uh, the thought is that 70 of them were a high court and the rest were just political leaders. And we know, according to the Mishnah in the Ethics of the Fathers, which says that, Sam, that Shimon HaTzadik, Simon the Just, was the last of the Men of the Great Assembly. And Simon the Just lives approximately 250 to 280 years before the Common Era. So it looks like the Men of the Great Assembly, whenever they started, they finished around the beginning of the 3rd century before the Common Era. After that, we have another um, group, which is called the Sanhedrin, which is the High Court in Jerusalem, which seems to take the place uh, together with the, the kings who led um, a Judea in the second half of the Second Temple. So, um, but these men of the Great Assembly, according to this tradition, they were the editors of Ezekiel and of the Twelve Prophets and of and of some of the other books too. Like, um, we'll see in a moment who they were. Uh, like the Book of Ruth, oh, excuse me, the Book of Esther, and the Book of Daniel, Ezra and Nehemiah and Chronicles. We'll see that in a moment. So you had 120 members of the men of the Great Assembly. In Hebrew, Anshei Neset Hagdola. Does that remind you of anything today? The They're parliament. The men of the Great Assembly, Anshei Knesset Hagdola. That's right, the parliament in Israel has 120 members, and it's referred to as the Knesset, which means the assembly. They took the idea from the Second Temple the men of the Great Assembly. Now, what does it say here about the men of the Great Assembly? They wrote Ezekiel, which again, wrote here means edited. Twelve minor prophets, they edited. The Book of Daniel, they edited. The Scroll of Esther, it says it. Esther and Mordechai wrote it. They edited it. Ezra wrote the book that bears his name, which means he both wrote it and edited. And the genealogy of Chronicles up to his time, and um, Nehemiah finished it. It says here. So, how come Jeremiah wrote his book and Isaiah needed Hezekiah to be the editor? I'm asking you that question because we, the answer is actually written in the book of Jeremiah. Jeremiah had his own editor. And it says in the book of Jeremiah, there was a fellow whose name was Baruch, the son of Nerian. And Baruch ben Neria is quoted as saying in the book of Jeremiah that he would speak and I would write it down in the book. So we know exactly who the editor of the book of Jeremiah was. His name was Baruch, the son of Nerian. I think he's actually mentioned here. Let's see if I can find him. Mm. Yes. Baruch. Baruch answered him, and he pronounced all these words to me in his mouth, and I wrote them down with ink in the book. So all, this is taken from, okay, the, the, from the Talmud, obviously, from the book of Jeremiah, but I forget the quote. So we actually know the editor of Baruch. Ben Jeremiah actually had his own scribe. So he didn't need an editor. Isaiah didn't. He needed an editor. I'm just going to run through the rest of this a little bit quickly because I don't want to go on too long tonight. Um, so that's basically it. So let's go back and uh, see. And what does it say here again? I'm going to run through it just quickly one last time. Moses writes the five books of Moses except for the last eight verses. According to the Tama. Um, Joshua writes his own book. Judges, Samuel, and Kings. Judges and Samuel is, is by Prophet Samuel, and the and the book of Ruth is the Prophet Samuel. Kings is Jeremiah. Isaiah is Hezekiah, his colleague, King Hezekiah. Jeremiah and Baruch Benaria wrote their own book. Ezekiel was the men of the Great Assembly. The Twelve Minor Prophets was edited by the men of the Great Assembly, the Second Temple period. Psalms. David, 
but it was also a collection. Proverbs, Song of Songs, and Ecclesiastes. Hezekiah and his group edited it. Job, Moses. Ruth, um, we mentioned before, Samuel. Esther, the men of the great assembly. It's one of the last books. Daniel, men of the great assembly. Ezra and Nehemiah, their own books. And also they split between them chronicles. That's according to the Talmudic point of view. Um, so this is like the tradition. I'm not going to try to defend or not defend. <laughs> I'm just saying this is the tradition. But there are a lot of interesting things in the in that. One of the things that I'll just mention briefly will give us a little bit of an indication what is the chronology of the Bible from when to when. So the Bible, of course, starts with a with okay, starts from the creation of the universe. So that's a long time ago. But when does it end? It looks like the Bible, the narrative of the Bible, ends with the beginning of the Second Temple period. Now, the Second Temple period is established, the Second Temple is established approximately 510 years before the Common Era. So 70 years, so 586 is the destruction of the First Temple. Approximately 70 years later is about 516. So approximately minus 516, meaning before the Common Era, is the Second Temple, when the Jews go back to Jerusalem. And um, the narrative of the Bible includes the first years. It, go, it includes 20 to 30, maybe 40 years after that. So the narrative of the Bible stops somewhere around 490 or 480 before the Common Era. That's the end of the narrative of the Bible. The question is, when was the canonization of the Hebrew Bible? But the narrative we can figure out, around 480, which is relatively, and um, it seems that this Men of the Great Assembly starts sometime after that. And that's why they are part of the editors of the Bible. So there are a few things we have to discuss, but I don't want to discuss it today. We'll discuss it next week. Number one, when was the canonization of the Bible? In Hebrew, we call it the Khatima, or the signature of the Bible. When was it finished? And is there a way of figuring it out? One way you can figure it out is, according to this, it wasn't finished until the men of the Great Assembly finished some of the editing. So for sure, it's after 480. Because the men of the Great Assembly go on for a few hundred years. I told you, the last of them is around 280 before the Common Era. Simon the Just, Shimon HaTzadik. So it's, that means that that group lasted possibly almost 200 years as, as, a, as, as, a, in, as a group that led the community in Judea at the time. Obviously not the same people. But, um, but when was the Bible finished? But it seems it was finished during the time of the men of the Great Assembly. The question is exactly where. I'll try to figure out next time. The next question also is, what about the books of the Apocrypha? Why are they not part of the Hebrew Bible? They were written by Jews. How come they're only found in the Christian Bible? Not all of them, but some of them. Like the, the book of Tobiah. Like the book of Judith like Maccabees 1. So why are they part of the Vulgata and not part of the uh, Jewish Bible? That I'll also discuss uh, next time, which is part of the, the question. Uh, and also, um, what about the translations of the Bible? Uh, the Septuagint, which is an early translation. Uh, Ptolemy Philadelphus, so, which is also about uh, somewhere the third century before the Common Era. How did you see that? Um, and did it have an effect on the Jewish Bible? So all these questions I'll deal with next time. And uh, I will, um, And I think that's enough for today. <laughs> and if you want to listen to it, it's not a problem. I will send you the, um, I'm going to turn off right now. I will send you the recording. And when you listen to the recording, by the way, you will be 